Pac-Man World 2 seems to wear its beta elements on its sleeve. From the manual, to the title screen, to the reward for 100%, it isn't difficult to grasp what could have been for this classic title. Normally this topic would be relegated to a bonus episode, but this series won't have one. I'm not going for 100%, so it seems pointless to hold off on bridging one of our most interesting topics yet. The cutting room floor is known for being a treasure trove of unused content, but I was surprised by how empty it was when it came to Pac-Man World 2. There are some early drafts of the official art, but otherwise there's no real gem to dig up here about the game's beta. Instead, the page discusses the differences between the original release and the player's choice, platinum release, and PC revisions. Unfortunately, I can find very little footage of these differences in action, so we have to take the cutting room floor at its word. The ghosts once killed in a single hit, true to the arcade classic. Blinky's frog shirked his position as baby's first boss. His tongue swings far faster in the earlier phases. Both the glow and dialogue revealing its weakness are absent. Bidoing Woods lacks the net at the beginning, and the directional Bidoing send the player in different directions. While the former difference is an increase in difficulty, there is no apparent reason for the difference in direction, although I have a theory. Most games despawn actors and textures as soon as they're off screen. The change in Bidoing directions might have been an attempt to lighten the load on the GPU, which may have caused frame skips in the first version of the game. Finally, in the Japanese version, difficulty is scaled in the opposite direction. Every pit in the first world is filled up with sand just like in Bare Basics, making death by bottomless pit an impossibility in the first world. Unfortunately, those are most of the documented differences I could find. Very little footage of the original version exists, and without purchasing it myself, documenting the rest of the differences is next to impossible. The cutting room floor was a dead end, but eventually I stumbled across a 2015 forum post on a site called VG Facts. User Super Mario 123311 posted four screenshots of the game in various stages of its development. It's worth noting that while these possess IGN's watermark, I was unable to track them down on their site, most likely due to their age. This first screenshot is nothing special. The power pellet has slightly different shading, and most of these models and textures went unused. The remaining screenshots each show unused actors. Not only are these fish different from the final game, but so too are the holes in the ice. My assumption is that the fish received a paint job because they look like something you'd find in Nicaragua, not Alaska. Super Mario Numbers claims that the texture file for the enemy Swamp Fly is still present in the game's files. Looking at this enemy, I have no idea what its intended attack pattern would have been, and it also seems like an enemy the devs would have a hard time making work in any other area. It's worth noting that the lily pads in the background are replaced by rocks in the final version. While the cutting room floor does not corroborate the existence of this enemy, Super Mario Numbers also names Side Sneaker as one of the unused enemies, and the cutting room floor does not. This enemy does appear on the title screen, making it clear that the cutting room floor missed some content in their sweep of the game. This is the final screenshot they posted, and it's clear that I saved the best for last. This level has shading and shadows, meaning it was far along in its development. I can't be the only one getting a Banjo-Kazooie vibe from the text box and the character it belongs to, right? I have a hard time deciding what exactly this creature is supposed to be, so I'll leave it to your imagination. Every non-boss level has 8 arcade tokens hidden within it. Another token can be obtained as the reward for 100%ing the level, and another for completing the time trial mode that unlocks after completing the level for the first time. Collecting all 150 tokens grants access to this building in Pack Village that was previously closed for repairs. Entering the building begins a slideshow of concept art of the game, and the best glimpse yet at its development. A lot of these are depictions of enemies that never made the cut. This Hockey Wolf is a great example of this. I'd imagine that Hockey Wolf would have been found in the Ice World, and would try to score a goal by knocking Pac-Man into the Death Water. Before Pac-Bears, Yetis were the lumbering giants of Ice River Run. Speaking of giants, this snake dwarfs even the Yeti. There is no way that this was a common enemy. It was either a boss or a friendly NPC. Notice the inner tube that Pac-Man's floating in? It seems as though it was going to be a recurring mechanic that was intended for both the water and the snow world. Besides the multitude of enemy concepts, the overworld map and Pac Village have several pictures devoted to them as well. There are some neat level concepts, and this. A fully modeled Sir Pacalot suggests that the beginning cutscene wasn't always intended to follow a storybook format. 
If you would like to take a look at the entire gallery, the card on screen will lead the way. Now, as we reach the end of this topic of the day, there's one final picture that I would like to show. While it's not the end of the series, I would like to extend my appreciation to the people in this photo. If only this team had received the recognition they deserved, and the green light to continue this series. In my eyes, this team could stand shoulder to shoulder with the rare team who developed Donkey Kong Country. I have such fond childhood memories of this game that I will never forget, and for that, I thank you.